Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here on this lovely day to celebrate poetry with Derek Austin and Keith Wilson. I'm Shauna Sherman, manager of the African American Center. Before we get started with our program, I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula and continue to live, work, and play here today. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramaytush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all the peoples who reside in their traditional territory. We wish to pay our respects to, by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramaytush community and affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples. We also honor the gifts, resilience, and sacrifices of our black ancestors, particularly those who toiled the land and built the institutions that established this country's wealth and freedom, despite never being compensated nor fully realizing their own sovereignty. We acknowledge this exploitation of not only labor, but of our humanity, and are working to repair some of the harms done by public and private actors. Because of their work, we are here and will invest in the descendants of their legacy. Again, welcome to the African American Center on the third floor of the San Francisco Public Library's main library, where for 25 years we've held space dedicated to the history, art, and culture of black people. Our center includes a diverse collection of more than 5,000 books, and we host programs like these and exhibits like the one you see behind me, right here, celebrating black Alex excellence and in invention. This exhibit will be up through May 7th and is accompanied by the Black Excellence Bookmark, which are available at all library locations, and I hope you pick one up today or pick one up when the next time you're at your local library. So for today's program, the black poetry tradition in this country is long and deep. We invite you to come to the library and see the vast collection of poetry we have on our shelves and are honored here today to have two bright stars of the modern poetry scene here today with us. We will be hearing readings from Derek Austin and Keith Wilson, after which they'll be in conversation, and at the end we'll have a little time for question and answers. I want to thank the Museum of the African Diaspora for their partnership in coordinating this program. So reading for us first is Derek Austin. Mr. Austin is the author of Tenderness, Boa Editions 2021, winner of the 2020 Isabella Gardner Poetry Award and the Golden Poppy Award nominee, and Trouble the Water, Boa Editions 2016, selected by Mary Sisbis for the A. Paul and Jr. Poetry Prize. His debut collection was honored as a finalist for the 2017 Kate Tufts Discovery Award, the 2017 Tom Gunn Award for Gay Poetry, and the 2017 Lambert, Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry, and the 2017 Norma Faber First Book Award. And his new book, Tenderness, was also nominated for a Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry this year. His first chapbook, Black Sand, will be released by Founding, Foundlings Press in February 2022. Keith Wilson is an Afrolation poet and Cave Conum Fellow. He is a recipient of the NA, NEA Fellowship, an Elizabeth George Foundation grant, and an Illinois Art Council Agency Award, and has received both a Kenyan Review Fellowship and a Stegner Fellowship. Additionally, he has received fellowships or grants from Breadloaf, Tin House, and the McDowell Colony, among others. His book, Field Notes on Ordinary Love by Copper Canyon Press, was recognized by the New York Times as the best new poetry book of that year. Please join me in welcoming our first reader, Derek Austin. Hi. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Fabulous. Um, I'm so excited to be here this afternoon. Um, to read some poems with y'all. Um, thank you to Shauna, thank you to the SF Public Library for organizing all of this. Um, and thanks to Keith for reading with me. I'm so excited to hear your poems. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna read from uh, Tenderness mainly and maybe I'll close out with something new. <clears throat> so this first poem I'm going to read is called Days of 2014. 
He had told me to circle the lake, smell of pepper and pine resin. Black people died or went missing that summer, every day it seemed, and here was someone who wanted to find me. We drank red wine, heavy and bitter. Sunlight moved across the lake with the hours, turns mixed their shadows and bodies in the water. When he laughed, a little foam gathered on his incisors. He helped me into the wild grass and slash pines when I couldn't walk. There is a roof one man's body makes over another. Pine needles on sharp grains, this is what I remember. This is how I escaped the world, a little foam. Tenderness. That summer I was a body. I was that body, the body. Overnight, a fog of linen inside the mauve Victorian down the block. Another house empty for the season, for the season, for the season. Hours built up on both sides of my bedroom door. Morgan and Denez rode in the Grand Canal at Versailles. Morgan filled a postcard with her hands and memory. Rose quartz, a diary, holy water, with what belief, what could I have asked for? Leaving my apartment for the first time in days, I walked five minutes to Lake Mendota. Barking, honking, shrieking, grunting, men tested their bodies for each other and themselves. Open doors to admit the breeze, the possibility of that one guest. When Emily Bronte wrote, they've gone through and through me like wine through water and altered the color of my mind, she wasn't talking about my depression. Double tapped a photo of Morgan and Angel posing near a green door with hinges older than the Constitution. They read their black poems in English to black people who spoke English and French and Arabic. If I sent a postcard to everyone I loved, it'd say, sometimes I think you're just too good for me. The most personal question I'm consistently asked, why are you so quiet? That I'm getting this all down wrong, that I'm getting it down at all. Um, so this next poem, uh, is called epithalamium, which is just a poetry term for a wedding poem. And um, there's two poems called epithalamium and tenderness, and, there's, and one is actually a, a poem I wrote for a friend's wedding. I'm not reading that one, I'm reading the other one, which isn't a conventional wedding poem, but it is thinking about union of things, history mainly, I think. Um, yeah, epithalamium. Today I'm happy by myself, wandering this creek's paths of sand and crushed shells, what used to be submerged. Mosquitoes drain me good. Before this river was redirected, it joined two others and flowed into the gulf. What we cannot change, we evade and call new. We delay. I could call the irrigation works at the headwater bog and obad against flooding. There are picnic spots nearby, gazebos and grills emerging from palmettos and bindweed. A storm blew down the oak I'd climbed to watch fireworks for free. Men still cruise out here. In this lush expanse, a man was lynched at the beginning of the century I was born in. Moving off the trail, I wade into the river. Time feels suspended. My bare feet shuffle pebbles like some grubbing shore bird. Screeching insects, thickets of sweet bay, and tie tie moldering scent. All this will be gone someday. Gone the paths and signs, gone the milkweed, gone the armadillos and the field and the lynching tree when this river rejoins the others and washes this away. No, not gone, but come together. History, nature, love, and loss wrought to scale in a glorious algal bloom a brightness of jade and amber, all this water moving toward where it's always belonged, where I cannot be, where I am. So um, there are a couple of letter poems in Tenderness that are uh, addressed to actual friends of mine. Um, so much of this book is, is a celebration of friendship, particularly uh, friendship among queer people and uplifting the ways that we can save each other. Um, and this is one of them. Letter to Brandon. 
I wish you were with me when I saw the most stylish black woman stroll down State Street in a red velvet coat. It was like a scene out of the hours. Carrying a bouquet, she entered those apartments near her favorite Italian place. Remember our muscular waiter's gentle voice. Her lilies, for her bay, I hoped, brightened an afternoon of two women detangling hair. Is this how you write fiction? Plot isn't fate, exactly. Drinking rosé at Gibbs, I thought of you typing in your dream house near Canada, the shadows of spruces on a lake. I'd be somewhere else, who knows where, waiting for your stories where no choice is barred or above consideration. Black Dandy. Under the shaggy honeysuckle, its sweet bruised heat, its migraine of scent, I remember the first time I tasted a flower. Playing with the other kids, we beset whole shrubs with our sticky, silly hands. We pretended to be knights, carried a stolen cabbage called Old Pilgrim, and took turns holding the head until it fell apart. Even though it rained that morning, the sky was bright and the air humid in the shade of trees we played under. When one of the boys scraped himself, I'd split dandelions and rub the milky halves into the cuts on his knee. I often didn't look them in the eyes, jealous of their eagerness to rejoin the others and climb a new branch. In my bedroom that night, listening to Phyllis Hyman, I admired my quartz collection. I finish my slurry of gin and ice. The pills that rescue my mind make sleep difficult. Palm trees like glaives, wind to the east. Overhead, white and yellow flowers shift one way, another if I turn my face. Blue Core. Being chased by a white man on the second floor of Sears is my earliest memory of panic. I was the age a kid could get lost in a rack of clothes. Kids got lost all the time in the 90s. Back then, the neighbor's son taught me to sip honeysuckles. We were inseparable until he moved. Where my childhood home should be, there's now a lot, which isn't notable. Homes flood. Homes packed with chemicals leveled into the dirt. The blizzard of 97 left a mountain at the park. We crawled through a hole at its base and laughed inside the blue core. Collecting snow, our multicolored sleds looked like clothes by a ditch. January 2017. You are the safest child in the world, I say to Plastic Jesus in the Nativity. My Facebook timeline is a villanelle of suffering. The boy from Aleppo whose dust skin is the color of water pouring still from faucets and flint. Drunk, recovering from last year, my eyes are wet moonflowers. Christmas tide is over. No carolers approach the well-lit houses. No one knocks on a stranger's door. And who would admit them? Sadness isn't the only muse. I can't imagine myself reading bedtime stories to a toddler, and I'm older than my father was when he read those brightly colored books to me. His voice is deeper than mine will ever be, but just as sweet. I always picked freight train. I loved the black caboose. A train runs across this track, through tunnels and cities, darkness and light, forever. I still love books where nothing happens, good or bad. The page is one landscape I move through. Lilting. In bed, we are lavender together. We watch the little theater of ours. Walking her dogs, our neighbor crosses the lakeside corner, hoop earrings echoing the birch's colors. Tend your joy you whisper, as if a charm against eviction or some harm we might inflict on each other. For once, I don't hear you from the room 
called memory. Open the window. Risk, breath, our seasons. Let them in, let them in. And um, I'm just going to close with a new poem, a newish, newer poem. Um, it's called The Birthday Interviews, and I wrote it because I, <laughs> I had a poetry homework assignment where I had to write about the day of my birth, which is like, I was like, who cares? Like nothing, like I was born. <laughs> like it was fine, it was just a day in August. Um, so what I did to make it fun for myself was I looked up what was happening at the time. So like, that's what this is about. So um, we're gonna travel back in time to late August in 1989. The birthday interviews. Mom said, I want to name him Patrick. Dad said he looks like a frog. The moon said, waning crescent. The thermostat said, it's South Florida. Cumulonimbus clouds were not in attendance. Mosquitoes said, sugar of life. The night said, welcome, young blood. Magazines in the waiting room said, Jackie O and Charles and Di and Axl Rose and Cher and Madonna and Oprah, skinny in a sparkling purple gown as the richest woman on TV. Ebony said, 25 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, what has and hasn't changed. Bat dance played on the radio. The TV said war on drugs. The TV said drought. The TV sang, thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Dade County said snakes and amphibians mangled by lawnmowers. The United States said the life expectancy of black men is 64.8 years. 1989 said the following for the first time, Latte, caffeinate, cyber porn, viral marketing, Generation X. Karen was the last thing the Atlantic Ocean said that hurricane season. Voyager 2 said of Neptune, what is this ring? What is this great dark spot? Saturn and Capricorn squaring Venus and Libra said, hello, small bachelor. Here's your near fetishistic desire for classical beauty. Said, it'll take your Saturn return, a whole revolution to begin loving yourself. Jesus didn't say anything, but a senator said he did. On a break, the attendant nurse brought a Dr. Pepper from the vending machine. Then she went outside with her menthols and Walkman to listen to self-help tapes. The cassette skipped and skipped and skipped. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So that was a, just beautiful. I also think that um, tenderness is like one of the all-time great titles for a book of poetry. Yeah, like I love that uh, title as well. But um, yeah, thank you all for for coming. Thank you to the library. Um, and I, as a coincidence, I'm gonna have to find it. Um, I actually also did that exercise with Derek, and I happened to bring my like my oh my, my poem for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this poem is called Memorial. And it starts with um, a, a, a quote from Ann Chin, who's the founder of the Middle Passage Project. And her, the quote is, we're just simply saying, mark the place where it began. Memorial. When I was born, the pipes froze white. I edged to midnight, but didn't step over. They were already married, my father and my mother, playing cards. My name was to be Winter the ceiling up against the sky. 10 years before they were married, they could have never married. When my father saw my body, he gave his name. In Mississippi, where the wooden ships came, water sat warm in every pot. So I'm gonna read, um, that's like the very newest thing, and then I'm gonna read two, if I can remember where I put, oh, sorry, one second. At the remote of there. I'm gonna read two uh, visual poems. These are newer poems. Um, and then I'm gonna go to my book and uh, for the rest of the time read from my book. Uh, and I don't know how, vi how like visible these are. This is always an experiment sharing these in public, which is part of the reason I try to do, it, uh, to do that. Um, but I'm also gonna try to describe it a little bit um, so that even if you can't see it, maybe you can sort of get a sense of what it looks like. So this first poem is actually the very first visual poem I ever wrote. It's called uh, Uncanny Emmett Till, and it's based uh, on an idea that 
I feel like when I first started writing about it, maybe like um, it, it felt like less people knew about it. It feels like more and more people know about this concept of the uncanny valley. It's sort of a, a concept in robotics and in, especially in like, I think people know it from animation at this point, from CG. Um, and it's the, this idea that like uh, people are very comfortable when they can, to they can tell with certainty that something isn't human. So when it's like a teddy bear or a cartoon. And they're also comfortable when they're so convinced that something is human that they actually can't tell that it's not human. So an example of this is when CG in a Marvel movie is so good that you actually can't tell that the actor's not really there. Um, in that case, you just accept it as a human. Um, and then there's this trough in the middle in this graph of the, the uncanny valley where people are, are, made, are, are unsettled when, they, uh, when something is so close to being human uh, that it almost passes for human. And this like, idea maps to me onto ideas of, of just binaries in general and identity that people really want to know. Uh, and so I used this graph and sort of reimagined it to tell the story of Emmett Till because in addition to, to sort of being, um, you know, this like sort of conceptual idea, uh, it also looks a little bit like uh, the mapping of, of a narrative. So this is called Uncanny Emmett Till. Uh, there's a legend um, and the, so the dotted lines are labeled boy and the solid lines are labeled a world. Only in retrospect is an animal worth recognizing. Something surely filled the time before the gunshot. A wolf whistle. Here lies the bullet. Call him Ishmael, laying like a nail in the esophagus of the Tallahatchie River. The body. Let the people see what they did to my boy. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. God is good all the time. And this is the second um, poem that I'll share that's a sort of a visual poem. This one uh, is called Angles of Incidents, and it's about the Central Park Five. Um, and it, it's, the graph itself is sort of um, an abstraction of Central Park, and it's literally uh, from a, like an old uh, math, math, like a geometry textbook. Uh, and it happens to sort of map onto a bunch of the, the paths and things in Central Park. The body is a haunt and non-Euclidean. Parallel paths will meet. Is a tree growing down the block? Is it the moon to you? Is the other side dark and small as the trouble it would take? And if you could, what might you? 84th and 5th, see nothing, a jog, an epiphany. And what does it take to turn an angle to a blade? Trisha Miley, a holy name, Sparrow's Eye, 110th and 5th, by Corey Wise, Raymond Santana, Yusuf Salam, Kevin Richardson, Antron McRae. Okay, so I'm going to transition to some of the poems from my book. Um, I'm going to start with Field Notes. So my, the name of my book is Field Notes on Ordinary Love, and that's sort of like uh, the way that it's, it's not exactly divided, but there's sort of two kinds of poems uh, largely in the book. There's the poems that are sort of about race and growing up in Kentucky and, um, and my family, and then there's sort of love poems. And this is about the first part of the title, Field Notes. Uh, all these scenes take place in, in Kentucky. Field Notes. One. In physics, dark matter isn't made of anything. It's a free citizen that passes unburdened through the field, through itself, through you. Two, it helps to observe from a distance the field, for instance, as a statement the South has chosen to make. The way whiteness, too, is often rhetorical, as when an older student remarks, in those beginning days that only he observed MLK's holiday while his black friends working did not. Three, sometimes love is a black dot in a field. Sometimes, suddenly, it is not. Four, or how can black be the absence of all color? Take this cruiser, see the light strike blue off the car like copper through a fountain. Five, there's a difference between what is fair and what is just. 
For instance, it is fair that I try to love your skin even when it is not touching my own. Six, whiteness is an alibi. The way the officer was like a steam engine only I could see. Seven, inside where nothing shows, I am of course not black, but that does not matter to the field. Eight, some colors are indistinguishable at night. Put your hands behind your back, a different cop once asked me. It was so sincere, he was so polite. Nine, as a boy, you learn to know the inside without being required to feel it, as when now I understand a bucket or a hood. 10, he asks my girlfriend not if she is white, since even in this light, what we are is obvious. But instead, he speaks philosophically. Ma'am, he asks, are you here of your own free will? 11, sometimes whiteness is a form itself of hyperbole. Try this. Sit in a field, then try reading Andrew Jackson's quotes on liberty, only pretend they are being written by his slaves. 12. Look at the word black on the paper, and you will see a definite black, a kind, a certainty, or if you see nothing at all, that of course is a kind of black too. 13. By the road, my father showed me cotton once. Look at that, he said. This next poem is called uh, The Way I Hold My Hands. I can't imagine my father wishing he would rather be anything. Once upon a time, he was a watermelon growing from a box. His mother died. His father beat the blush out of him and teardrops dripped black from his face into his food. My father's father made him eat his dinner through himself. The miracle whip salad spangled like the garden in dew. This isn't a figure of speech. My father ate his blood. It's hard to think he must have been young. He made me stop all my life. He told me not to be a girl. Whatever I was doing, of course I stopped. He kissed me on the top of the head before I went to bed each night. He was always there. He read to my brother. He read to me from a book of animals. This is a fox's paw. This is a bear's. He told me, I'll give you something to cry about. He never touched me. Bear claw, I said. Winters are easier for bears. I spread my fingers over his. No, my father said. Um, I'm going to read, kind of decide, or even see if I have it. I think two more poems. Uh, the first poem, actually, I think I'm going to read, one, one longer poem. So this will be my final poem. This is a poem, um, that closes my collection. It's a poem called Heliocentric, and it has an epigraph from the Odyssey, um, if I beg and pray you to set me free, then bind me more tightly still. So this is the scene in the Odyssey when Odysseus asks his crew to, to like strap him to the mast so that he, um, he won't sort of be like attracted by the muses and, and crash them all. This is called Heliocentric. I'm striving to be a better astronaut, but consider where I'm coming from. The exosphere, a desk where the bluest air thins to a lip. Impossible to know the difference from where I sit in space. I promise I still dream of coming back to you, settling on your yellow for the kitchen. We won't fight, let it not manifest, not over the crumpled bodies of laundry. Let us not row over the nail polish its color, the spilled sun. Inspiration is the deadliest radiation. It never completely leaves the bones. You know, from here, there are no obstructions but the radiant nothingness. An aurora borealis opens like a fish. This, to the pyramids, yes, to a great wall. And there you are moving from curtain to curtain. Oh, to fantasize of having chosen some design with you. But the moons over Jupiter, 
but asteroids like gods deadened by the weight of waiting. I remember you said pastel for the cabinet where the spice rack lives, that I ought to pick you up flowers when I had a chance. Daisy, iris, sun, red roses, ultraviolet, the color of love. What else but this startles the air open like an egg? I'm really trying to be better, to commit to memory the old songs about the ground, to better sense your latitudes, see the corona of your face, take your light as it arrives. Earth is heavenly too, but know that time is precious here, how wine waits years and years to peak. What is there to do? I've made love to satellites in your name. I'm saying I can't say when I'll return. Remember me, for here are dragons and the noble songs of sirens, stars that sway Elysian, ships that will not moor, lovers who are filled with blood and nothing more. Who could love you like this? Who else will sow you in the stars? Who better knows your gravity and goes otherwise to catastrophe? I've schemed and promised to bring you back a ring from Saturn, but a week passes or doesn't manage. Everything steers impossible against the boundless curb of light. Believe I tried for you, against space. Time takes almost everything away. To you, for you, a toast to the incredible. I almost wish I'd never seen the sky when always there was you. Sincerely. Thank you all. I guess we can just like, well, how good are we on time? I guess is the real question. <laughs> it's like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, let's just like hee hee for a minute. And <laughs> yeah. If folks, if folks have questions. Um, yeah. It was really amazing hearing you read. Yeah, thank world. you. This has been, this has been amazing. I'm glad it's, it's, this is like the first time that I've done a live reading in as long as I can remember, so. Oh my God, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't even remember the last time I did one, so yeah. Oh, it's Very nice. Welcome back to the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess like, like I, one of the things I'm always mesmerized about you and your work is your visual poems. I'm just like, I'm just so fascinated by how you come about your forms? Like, do you, like, how do you find them? Do you start with the image? Like, you just see, like, a form, and it's like, oh, I get, the, like, poems in here. Or do you, like, work on, a, on, like, you know, a regular poem, and you feel like something's missing, and then you're like, I need a visual thing? Yeah, I, I feel like at, at this point, so I, part of the answer is just that I write, uh, like, a whole, whole lot, and, um, and sometimes there's, I just have a feeling sometimes like, like, what am I doing with all this? Uh -huh. Um, because I, you know, the, when you write in general, I think the majority of what you write, you, you're like not feeling or whatever. <laughs> um, and the more that you write, the more that you have of it. So sometimes I think I just started changing the way that I look at the stuff I'm writing is like, maybe this can be like material for a different thing. Like if it's not working as a poem, um, I'll just like keep it in the back of my mind if there's anything about it that I think is interesting. And so sometimes I'll come across like a graph or something and I'll be like, yeah, just something about it. I'll be like, this sort of like, maybe this could work with this other idea that I have. And so I'll like take snippets of things. Um, so in, in some ways it's like more like collage, um, at least at first, than, than some of my other, you know, sort of, tr sort of traditional poems. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, I got a chance to sort of see, um, I think it's especially interesting when something sort of comes from a, like a writing prompt, because I am also s sort of interested in what your writing process is like, because I, I remember the writing prompt w that we got, we both got was sort of like, yeah, was, was right about um, the day that you were born. And I took it sort of, I like literally just asked my mom some questions. Um, and you, you like arrived at it at such a different point. So I'm sort of wondering, yeah, like what you're what your thought process is when you're writing or, or um, in general, sort of how your poems come about? Um, I mean, like that one, because I don't, I don't often, I'm not a prompt kind of person. Like prompts usually get on my nerves. Um, so like with that case, I just had to find some way to make it fun for me. 
And I was like, okay, what's the most interesting way I can go about this? Plus, like, we had a timeline. We had, like, a week to write this thing. <laughs> yeah, we wrote that. <laughs> True. So yeah. I'm like, how can I, like, do something real quick? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that really speaks to, like, I guess my process overall is, like, just trying to entertain myself more or less. Like, I just don't want to bore <laughs> myself um, is I think where I'm at with uh, my writing process. Like it usually starts with um, like an image or just like something. It's usually just something that gets stuck in my head. Like whether it's like an image I can't shake or like a line that I think sounds really interesting and I just like roll it around until finally I commit to uh, writing it down. Like I, like I don't write a lot um, really. Like I, which is, yeah, it's annoying. But like, so it usually takes me a while to like get something from my head to the page. Like the drafting part is like the most terrifying thing for me. Like I love revising things. So like once it's on the page and it's like, okay, now I can like look at it 360 and like figure out what I need to do. Um, but drafting is terrifying. And I think uh, like I'm trying to get to a space where um, I can find the fun in that. Um, which I think is like something I really admire about you and your work and just like your spirit of play with your poems. Like you'll just like do a thing and see what happens with it. And I think, I just think that's the coolest thing in the world. And I'm wondering if you could like talk about, you know, play in your work and like how that, uh, influences you. Yeah. And that's a huge, a huge part of, I think, um, the way that I think about writing, um, it, which is so interesting about hearing you talk about, um, like making it be interesting to you and enjoying it because I, I feel like it's actually really rare that we hear, right? At least that I hear uh, poets or artists talk about like, it, like the enjoyment of writing. Like, like I think especially, maybe part of it too is like a lot of times people's projects are like very um, just like sad or, or yeah. dark or whatever. And so <laughs> it's, sometimes it's sort of hard to talk around the, the, uh, around that. Like the subject matter itself is really hard. Um, and, and it's true of like maybe all the poems I read today is yeah. like, they're not, <laughs> you just, they're not you like just fun, <laughs> fun topics. Yeah. Um, but there is something about like the act of creating that, that, um, I think f for most people, I, I hope anyway, like brings some sense of like, um, of joy. And, and I think plays is the best word for it because play has all these other definitions, right? Like it means like to play a game, but it also is what you use to describe like playing an instrument and anyone who's ever practiced an instrument knows sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's like the most miserable thing in the entire world. Um, and they're both like both those experiences are both play like both in both instances, you're playing the instrument. Um, and so the, I don't know, that's like part of the way that I, I, I sort of think about writing as well is that it has to be it, like, if it's not engaging for me, like I, I don't know how I can expect it to be engaging for anyone else. And so it's just like oftentimes trying to find the way that, that, that that can happen, and sometimes that's through language. It's like my 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 book is entirely through sort of traditional poems, um, and more and more lately, um, it, it also includes all these other things. But it's always just like doing things. Um, I think to like push myself and and like continue to care about the thing that I'm that I'm working on. So yeah, yeah. That's so, that's so interesting. Like <laughs> that point about like poets not finding fun in this thing. Like, no, like it's so real. Like I yeah. talked to poet friends of mine and like the way they talk about writing, it's like as if they're walking on glass and I'm like, uh, like why, like, why do you keep doing this then? Like, we're not making yeah. money off this. Like, why, like, why are you doing this to yourself? <laughs> so many other things you could be doing. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but like, I think like that raises like such an interesting, well, like it, it brought to mind like, um, sort of like what I'm finding fun in poems right now. So I'm just like curious, like what you're finding fun about like your work or just like poems you're reading in general, like what's exciting to you right now? Oh, I no, Yeah. I also want to know what you, what you find, what you're like finding interesting and fun. When, so I've been reading a, a huge amount lately and, um, and so that's part of what I think I've, I'm reading more and more experimental stuff. And, um, when I was younger, I would read something that was really like sort of out there and just feel like I had failed on some level. Cause I was like, I don't know what's going on here. And that means that like either I wasted my time or I just don't know where to go from here. Like I, I, I like, I don't know how to receive this thing. And the thing is that I've like come to sort of decide on or settle into is that like, I don't know that I'm any better at 
figuring it out sometimes. Like I still read things many times. I'm reading Ann Carson, and there's just many times where I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. Um, <laughs> many times where, where I, I feel like I do, but like also many times where I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And and sort of being comfortable with that, like like that I don't have to always know. And um, and it's actually there's a way in which it's. I'm like more interested now in things that are I interesting as opposed to things that I can an like answer for. Like, like I think about some of the things that I'm reading um, way more when I actually don't know the answers to them, and, and I'm like sort of excited by that. And so uh, maybe that's part of the reason that I'm like pushing myself into these other mediums that um, that I know less about because th there's more to think about um, when when, you, when you're like challenged in that way and so that's one of the things that's been exciting me a lot but yeah what what, what do you, either in, in stuff that you've been reading or in what you've been writing what, what's been sort of interesting for you or fun yeah I mean I, I wish I were reading more my brain is still just like rot <laughs> um, so like I still need to like make myself read but I think like in the poems I'm writing um, I'm really interested in shapes which is like a weird thing to say but like I like the way that my new poems look. Like I'm trying to write poems that don't look like the poems I've written before. Uh, um, like, like literally on the page. Yeah, like, just like their awesome. shapes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, cause like typically, like I'm like, my stanzas tend to be pretty orderly and like everything tends to be fairly symmetrical. And now I'm like, well, what happens if I write like a really short, tiny poem? Like what happens if I like radically shrink the line or if I like make the line really long? Um, like I've just been really interested in like raggedy looking shapes in my poems. <laughs> yeah, I love it, that. it makes it makes my poems move in a different way, which is really exciting. And I think that it opens up new possibilities for me. Um, I, and I think that in a way it's uh, making me better at playing in poems, I think. Like I, I the thing that I maybe dislike the most about myself as a poet is like uh, like being obsessed with making a thing perfect. And now I'm just like, I'm less interested in that. I'm just like, have I, have I gone somewhere new with myself? Like whether it's like the way that the poem is ordered or, you know, like have I pushed myself into something different and like, did I, did I do that work? You know, I think like the work of fun is I think something I'm trying to do. Yeah. And figure out. I love that. I mean, one of the things that, that I realized um, a little while ago was the, the, I think there's a way in which even when you feel like you're pushing your work or being experimental that you still fall into like habits. Oh and, yeah. And, <laughs> and I notice that like all my poems, like if they, if they, if they're not kind of the same length, I start to become uncomfortable. Like if they're, if they're short, I'm like, have I really said anything yet? And if they become too long, I'm like, oh, I'm, I must be rambling. Um, and like, that's not tr like, that's not how poems work. Like it, there's not like a, a length that they're supposed to be. Um, and so, yeah, it's really interesting. Like the, the shape of the poem, you like, you like receive it. You're like when you're writing and you look at your own thing, you're like, oh, this is the way that that I need to be writing. Like like my lines need to be this length, or my stanzas need to be, um, and just changing that up can really, yeah, I, I agree. Like really change um, how it feels and 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 makes your work. Um, it like it just changes your work. I, one of the things that. Um, that I've tried doing is like changing the um, orientation on the, on the computer where it's like landscape so the, the pages oh. are really wide. And then it makes, it makes you like not know how long your lines are anymore. <laughs> uh, because my, that's one of the things about my, my, my work is my line lengths are almost always exactly the same length. And it's like really <laughs> hard for me to stop myself from doing that. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting thinking about like the shape itself of the poem. Because that's like a visual element. It's like mm -hmm. um, we don't think about. I, I, you know, I, the poems I shared are like extremely visual, but um, but I think most poems are vi visual to an extent, um, and that's like one of them is like how it looks on the page. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, and I think that's the reason why for a long time I was so invested in making sure my poems looked symmetrical. Because like you get so much information before you even read the poem, just looking at it, like seeing a block of text and it's just like, no, <laughs> it's like, I, I can't, this is too long. This is too much. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it makes a big difference. And like a thing that I was thinking about um, today, I think, uh, yeah. Cause there was a Lucille Clifton poem that I retweeted that I had never read before called Palm Sunday, which is really short. And I read it and I liked it a lot. And, and to me, I'm like, this 
was like a good, in my head, I'm like, this was like a good meal. Like, it was like a, like, it, it's not one of her best poems, I don't think, but like, it still felt good to read it. And it was just like, I think a big part of it was how short it was. And it's like, not every poem, then this is the thing I always have to tell myself, is like, not every poem needs to be like, Paradise Lost. Like, you don't have to, like, reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Sometimes it's just, like, do what the poem needs you to do, and, like, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I, she's, such a, she's such a good example. She's one of my favorite poets, and one of the things that blows me out, like, every time I read one of her, like, one of her especially really short poems, I'm always, like, there's so many ways in which I would never have written this poem. Like, just her, like, confidence and ability to pull off a really short poem is just something I, I like, never do. I, the moment that... I can't say anything that I feel comfortable enough being like, that's all that I am going to say about right, that. Right, I'm like, done. I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> and she does it all. She, it's, it's just amazing. Um, her, her, yeah, her, her short poems in particular. Her, like, very short poems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I can't. <laughs> so good. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, yeah. Um, should we open it up to yeah, folks? <laughs> Folks have questions. <laughs> uh, question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first question for Derek. Um, well, I loved your birthday poem. Thanks. I, I know you like write about history a lot, and I was just wondering, like, do you ever like start with an image and then like through research kind of arrive at something very different? And do you feel like you like learn a lot through the process and what that looks like for you? Yeah, totally. Like that's my favorite one of my favorite things about writing poems is just the way that they shift over time because more often than not like the thing the thing that i think is the poem and like when i'm finally comfortable to like put it on the page like by the time i finish like actually finish the poem like almost none of that was there like the thing that i think is the poem is is rarely if ever the thing and so so much of revising for me is like figuring figuring out what the poem needs to do and like research is a is a fun part of that like I it's one of my favorite things about being a poet is that research is like almost like procrastination so like I still feel like I'm doing work even though I'm just like looking at things on Wikipedia <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's definitely like a big part of my process is just like research too yeah, thank you, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I also wanted to ask Keith, um, yeah, well, I guess first question is just like how you got started with the visual poems. And I know a lot of them are kind of based on like, um, like science-y things. And yeah. I kind of come from a science background too. And I was just wondering, like, um, I'm just curious about like the way your brain works and like, um, like shapes and how you see things in different disciplines and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, so. I mean, there's like a, in some ways, a very direct answer, which is, um, is like Krista Franklin, the 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 poet and artist Krista Franklin is is like a, a, to a large degree the reason I'm in, I'm working in visual poetry, par partially because that's what she does, and like, I think a lot of times you just you almost just need someone to give you permission or to like show you that this thing can be done. Um, and so she did that, but I also like was going to be, so I, I met up with her one day and we were talking about potentially collaborating on something and we were just talking about things that we thought were interesting and we were talking about robots and race and uh, like Afrofuturism essentially. And I can't remember exactly how it even happened, but um, I felt like I, I could not describe, I, I felt like I was both kind of describing what I was trying to say and couldn't really describe it. And so I like made the Uncanny Emmett Till poem mm -hmm. was like my notes to like show her what I was trying to describe. Um, and we ended up not meeting up again. And I, like many years later, someone asked if I had anything to share um, for a journal, uh, uh, Shayla, Shayla Lawson, um, who is another amazing poet, who is also a visual poet. Uh, and I was just like looking through things and I was like, I was like, this is maybe a poem. Um, so it's kind of just like happenstance combined with um, with, with having worked with, with Krista. Um, and then to answer the sort of like, it, how, like the inspiration or, or, or how I'm sort of thinking about these. I, yeah, my dad was an electrical engineer. Um, I went to school for four years in computer science before I switched, <laughs> um, 
which was like in many ways the like a terrible decision. <laughs> like I should have just finished that degree probably. Um, but yeah, so like I have like a background in science and and like grew up talking about science. And I think for whatever reason, the like growing up, I never I, I like just didn't differentiate between my interests. They were like all equally things that I, I thought were were cool and there was no reason that they like might not belong together. Um, so like I played video games, I made games, I made poems, I made I made lots of things. I made like greeting cards and things. Like I just made lots of things as a, as a child. I don't like I was just like a person who liked making things. Um, and to this day like I, I when I'm making something um, and I run across something else, there's just like the moment where I'm like can I just add this to the thing that I'm working on? Like, is would this work? And I try it out. So it's uh, like a lot of experimentation, just like things that are sort of interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's really cool. Um, yeah. I feel like I, I also come from like science and math background, and then, but I I feel like recently just doing more like creative things. I find that like some of those ideas kind of transcend any discipline. And I think it's cool that in art, you're able to kind of combine whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one, I mean, one of the unfortunate things about the way that those, many of the subjects are taught, um, or maybe all subjects are taught in school, is that they're like differentiated in classes. Mm -hmm. And so in a computer programming class or in a science class, you will never talk about anything other than that subject in like a very abstract way. Um, and so, yeah, so you, it's like outside of the class where you can actually be like, what is it like to think about computer programming in the humanities? Or what is it like to think about physics like from the perspective of like an artist as opposed to like purely you know, an experiment to talk about how fast something travels or whatever? Um, because like, we actually live our lives like holistically. We don't live them the way that they're sort of taught in class. And, and so yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in like letting those things bleed out and, and mix together and so on, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like I envy like those old philosophers who kind of did everything. Yeah, back know? back before they were like, yeah, when 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 like the philosopher or mathematician or whatever did like everything. Yeah, they were like yeah, yeah. gardener, and, poet, yeah. painter, sculptor, doctor. Yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> I was wondering um, how you you both define yourself as black poets and. Um, like you both went to Cave Canem, if you could talk about that experience as well. Yeah. Uh, well, so I I went to school in Kentucky, and well, so when I was very young, when I was until I was like 13, I grew up in uh, in Southern California, and went to a very diverse school. And when we moved to Kentucky, I was it was like just me and my brother basically. There were very few black people. Um, where I, where I grew up um, as like a teenager and, and young adult. And so in many ways, um, the Appalachian poets, which introduced me to Cave Canem, uh, are like the reason that I'm a poet. Like, it was just like, there, there are many ways in which the place where I was in Kentucky was overtly racist, but there were, in many ways, the like more devastating thing was the ways that I felt alienated in ways that no one was intending. That, that like, I just felt very alone and couldn't write the things that I wrote, no one like um, understood. Felt like no one understood, and and um, or like had any access to. And so it was like Cave Canem, where I felt like I could literally share anything, and and there was there was someone who understood where, like where I was coming from, and that like includes like those math poems and stuff, because Cave Canem is not just like black folks; it's like black folks from a, a ton of different backgrounds. Um, and so, like, I, I could be black and weird is like part of the thing that like Cave Canem and a lot of these different like Kalu is another thing I, I, I uh, took part in um, that they like really freed me up to that like um, the blackness comes in all these different uh, comes from all these different directions and all these different interests and includes all these different things that um, that I think is like so important to uh, to the reason that I'm even making art and not just sort of like you know still in Kentucky working at the Amazon warehouse or whatever, just thinking one day maybe I'll write a novel or whatever. I think Cave Canem is, is a big part of why, why I'm an artist. Yeah, I mean, similar to be, it was, it was liberatory for me. Um, like I'm from a military family, so like I grew up just moving around all the time. And so like I sort of grew up uh, without like a stable sense of community that wasn't my family. And, um, 
I went to college and I was an English major and, you know, it, I had like a great education in like undergrad, but I was often like the only black person in my workshops. So, you know, like I, I had such a, at the time I had such like a limited understanding of like the potential of black poetry and what it could be like to like, all I knew was like the Harlem Renaissance poets and the black arts movement poets. And I'm like, love them, but like, what do I do now? So like, I remember getting to Cave Canem when I was a grad student and it just, like Keith said, just like seeing like the plenitude of black poets and just like, ep like everybody's just doing everything. And you know, there is no one way to write black poetry, just like we're black and we write poetry. So <laughs> there you go. You know, like, like that was just, you know, that was really the important thing for me was just seeing so many like black people writing about every subject under the sun in all kinds of styles, um, from all walks of life. Um, and we're just out here doing it. And it's amazing. <laughs> yes. do, so do you think like if you, as a black poet, if you're not writing like about a black subject, say like Emmett Till or um, I, there's other histories in some of the poems I heard, like would, do you think that there's acceptance for that or? Like, I was always wondering if, as a black poet, you need to, like, just write black poetry, you know, that has, a, like, a black subject or that is political and, then, you know, it's doing I, Well, I, I think on one hand, like, like, I am the black subject, and so everything that I'm writing is, is like, is, like, is black. Right? Yeah. Like, um, so in, in many ways, I, I think part of the reason I write, like, so, sort of, like, about the history or, or, or like, overt blackness is, is actually just that that happens to interest me and, and um, it happens to interest me in, in, in specific ways. And also the fact that for a, a very long time, those are the kinds of poems that actually that like black artists couldn't write or, or like, um, you know, it, it, for a long, long time in order to write um, poetry as a black person, you had to write very specific kinds of poems uh, or at least there was a pressure to, like maybe you didn't have to. Um, but like the publishers were looking for certain things or, um, or white audiences accept certain kinds of narratives. And this is still true that, that there are audiences asking for very particular narratives. Um, and so I, I don't know, part of the reason I'm writing some of the things that I write has to do with m like my ability to, like I'm both interested in and live in a time in which I can write um, about, uh, about violence or, or the history of, um, of like r racialized oppression or these different things and, and I can get them published. I, like people can read them. Um, they're important to me and I, I hope to sort of communicate um, to an audience why, why um, these, these subjects matter and, and the fact that I can is, is, is like amazing, right? Yeah, and you know, I think it's something that's really exciting to me about black poetry is when black poets write about subjects where white audiences wouldn't expect us to be uh, uh, versed in. You know, like one of the poets who I adore is Natasha Trethewey, who like blew my mind when I first read her book in high school. I bought Native Guard and I'm like, oh my God, like this is, this is it. Like this is what I want to do. And like I love when she writes ekphrastic poems, poems about like European paintings that reckon with blackness in European art. And it's like, that's like an essential part of our history too. You know, so I think like you don't, as a black poet, you don't necessarily have to write about black history per se, but I think that it's that our subjectivity is important to be everywhere. Like it's, I love when black poets write about science and about ecology and you know, medicine and all kinds of fields. Like we need those voices, we need those lenses everywhere. And I think like that's, that too is black poetry, you know? Yeah, I have one more for Keith. I, I was just um, thinking about the name of the book, and you said you read a lot of experimental stuff. Um, and it just reminded me of Field by Joss Charles. And I don't know if you Yeah, I don't know that. it, actually. Oh, OK. Well, I would, yeah, I recommend it, I guess. But um, it's it's a book where you're, uh, you like read it out loud, and the, the words are like spelled um, not according to the English dictionary, so it's very auditory so I feel like it's something you would love but yeah I have to check it out this is one of the things that you realize <laughs> I feel like the more that you read is how much you still have not read <laughs> like, uh, like like 
it just is never there's like my list of things that I I I, I want to check out is is like ever growing. But yeah, I have to check it out. Yeah, but I guess my question was like, um, I guess the word field um, is important in your the poems you read, and I was just wondering um, what it represents in your collection, like what you think of as like the field, and um, I think. In Josh Charles' collection, also like has some significance. So I was kind of wondering, like, how you perceive field and yeah, such a good question. <laughs> I, I I think I'm very drawn to words that have many, mm-hmm. both many definitions and many sort of like um, like connotations. Like like the I love. I'm very interested, sort of going back to what Derek was saying about um, black people coming from all these different fields and having perspectives like like applying their subjectivity to that field that that you know the arts um sort of being received by a black person is is unique and different and interesting um like i'm always interested in the way that words work that way too and one one of those words is is like the word field which um not only is different depending on where you live and like what your race is and what your history is and and everything it was different for me when I lived in California and when I moved to Kentucky, that like it, it was very, it felt like a very neutral term in California. And when I lived in Kentucky, um, it had like a history attached to it about what happened in the fields, um, and and also was all like simultaneously very um, like benign or, or or innocent too. Like like there, there were lots of fields where I lived that were some of them were like horse fields some of them were just like empty fields like lots where like suburbs were being built and so on um and so anyways all that is to say that that one of the reasons i was really interested in that word was um was just like the presence of these like big open spaces and um and how like the very active like contemplating in them and sort of associating um that space with what had happened there and what had happened to you uh, like brings about all the all these like new thoughts and ideas and um, and and s- sort of like r- like um, reenacts history in, in a certain sense um, and yeah the, like I, it's a word that I continue to actually write about because it, it's also like a science word um, mm-hmm. and and has all these other uh, like sort of attachments and, and and so on too so yeah um, yeah. I, 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 between that and the word love, those are like two words that like are constantly appearing. In my <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> so, as young men, I'm so surprised, and I just smiled when I walked in. Um, as young men, how did you get started? And you may have already answered this with poetry. What did you think of Langston Hughes? And uh, Maya Angelou, did you ever get intrigued with their writings and feel inspired by them? Or is it just that you started from, you know, where you were as younger men looking at uh, poets, uh, maybe just a little bit older than you? I mean, definitely when I was, like, when I first started writing poems in high school, I was writing, like, my terrible, sad, angsty poems in high school. But I, you know, I was really interested in poetry, so you know, I feel like I do what a whole lot of poets do is like try and find their people. So like I remember just like Googling black poets, like who are the black poets? <laughs> and you know, the Google was like Maya Angelou, Langston Hughes, and you know, I I read a bunch of them in in high school. Like that was like my introduction. Um, you know, it was like uh, the black arts movements poets. You know, I had. Uh, the Black Poets Anthology was a gift that my mom gave me. So I was, you know, reading Sonia Sanchez and, and Nikki Giovanni. And, you know, I was I was obsessed with Langston Hughes for a long time. I loved County Cullen. County Cullen is still one of my favorite poets. Um, but yeah, like they, they, they were like a foundation for me when I first started. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in, in high school I read um, a huge, like, the the I read a huge amount of Edgar Allan Poe and I like wrote a lot like him <laughs> um, back then, which is like wild to me now. Um, and but I remember going to the library. I actually like I don't remember the first time that I found a poet or a book um, of very many poets, but I, I literally remember the day that I found um, uh, Langston Hughes at the library. I like p- pulled it off the shelf and um, 
and was reading it like in the aisle. Like I, like I was like so arrested by it. Um, especially I think his like directness of language. I was just like blown away by it because Edgar Allan Poe, who's like the poet, and, and Rudyard Kipling was another poet who I read growing up. Um, their language like felt so old fashioned and sort of like like um, like highly wrought that I both liked it, but also had just never seen anyone sort of be as direct as, as Langston Hughes was being in, in that book. And, and my Angela actually was way more familiar with as like a as a prose writer. I'd read, um, you know, I know I the Cage Bird sings, um, and 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 was you know sort of blown away by that as well. Um, so yeah, both both of them were were very influential to me. And then I think the next the like next uh, black poet who's super influential to me was actually Yusuf Komenyaka. Um, I like di didn't know how to describe what his poems were doing, like doing to, to, to like my heart basically. Like, I, I was just like, I don't know what he's doing, but I'll, I'm also like blown away by it. So those were like three of the um, uh, poets when I was younger who, who like really were important to me, yeah. So maybe we can close with advice for aspiring writers. <laughs> um. Advice for writers, I mean, read everything. <laughs> like, like, read everything you can get your hands on. Um, you know, read, read poetry, obviously. Read contemporary poetry, but read the old stuff, too. Read things from hundreds of years ago. Um, you know, read fiction, read nonfiction. Like, truly, because that's all just fuel for your poems. You know, if you're a person who um, gets a lot of inspiration from fashion magazines, read all the Vogue copies you need to. Um, don't feel hemmed in, you know, I suppose is like a, a thing I would say. Yeah, I, I, I think my main advice um, is also like, like there's not always a whole lot that we can do about it, but I, th I think the main thing for me that, that let me be a poet, because I was always gonna be creating things, um, and that might be fine, right? Like, like it might be the case that if you're an artist, the main thing you want to do is create things, and it's not as important to you actually to share them with like a larger audience. Um, and so I'm always like trying to encourage people like like don't feel pressure to do to to like be a published poet if that's not really what you want to do. Yeah. If you like just like creating things and sharing them <laughs> with your family or just keeping them to yourself, that's fine. But if you are interested in like trying to get stuff published, um, that's like a, a like a, a lot. It's like a huge barrier, um, and it's very can be very difficult and depressing. And so the main thing. Um, my main suggestion for folks who are trying to do that is, is to try to find some sort of community to like, to, and that's like the hard thing sometimes, right? Like, um, but like to not shy away from like finding people online if that's, if there are not people where you live, because where, where I live, there are only like, like two people who are writing poetry. Um, and, and, you know, I tried to spend all the time that I could with them, but, uh, but you know, it was, it was hard. Um, but yeah, really, if you can find some sort of community, some friends who you can like share your work with, who you can read their work, you can talk about poetry, you can read a book and be able to talk about it. Like as a person who's like so um, like in the world of poetry now, I still don't think, I, I still have a hard time sometimes talking about the stuff I'm reading. Like, uh, and that's like a, such a weird thing. Like when you watch a movie, you know, often you've like gone with someone to, to see it or you can easily just talk, have you seen the new Marvel movie or whatever. Um, the like closed offness of poetry can be so unsettling and, and difficult that I think it's really important to try to find other folks that you can you can share it with. So yeah, that's my I think my big advice for for anyone trying to like publish. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. I'm just gonna get on camera real quick so I could thank you guys in person. <laughs> so once again, thank you so much to Derek Austin and Keith Wilson for coming through. Their books are available at the library. We have Tenderness by Derek Austin and Field Notes on Ordinary Love by Keith Wilson. Thanks again, and please join in me in thanking them as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs>